So we now start the, um, the seminars. And thanks for welcome to International Exchange on Performing Arts Documents. And the subtitle programs are Future Core Documentation. So uh, today we are great to have two distinctive speakers to attend our uh, seminars and each res respectively give a talk on <coughs> a topic related to performing arts and documentations. Um, the first speaker uh, I would like to introduce is Professor Jeffrey Shaw. Professor Shaw is the leading uh, figures in new media art since the 1960s. He produced a lot of the very rich profiles of uh, visual arts and creative arts uh, in many different forms. So. Uh, he also was one of the founders of EZKM for visuals media in uh, Germany. And he was dean of the School of Creative Media at the University, City University of Hong Kong. Um, uh, Professor Shaw, is, his profile is so rich to cover within the, a short sentence. But from his uh, presentation, we can see a wide range of works including different types of media in, uh, incorporate in installation, interactive art, and so rich uh, to be um, summarized in a few sentences. I, and today, I, we are gl glad to invite Professor Shaw to share some of his experience, creative experience, and lead us to some of the imaginations for the future. Uh, no matter for visual arts and performing arts. And thanks, Professor Shaw. Thank you, Patrick. I turn the mic to you. Good. Okay, thanks very much, Patrick. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Um, let me now see if I can uh, successfully share my screen with you. Um, if all goes well, it should be this. And now, if I hit play, we should be seeing my keynote. Yes, indeed. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let me just move this bar up a little. Good. Okay, uh, again, thank you for this opportunity to uh, make a presentation today. Um, in terms of my own art practice as a, as a new media artist, uh, I'm going to focus this keynote on the, uh, the performative in new media art. Uh, and uh, in the course of doing this, you will of course uh, also uh, and recognize the implications uh, in terms of, uh, of documentation. Um, in this keynote, I'll describe how I use uh, interactive and immersive media to enable uh, the invocation of uh, varying degrees of somatic engagement and provide the circumstances required for embodied uh, cognition. Um, the radical turn in the 60s was away from the passive spectator of static objects to the viewer's physical engagement in dynamic real-time events and situations. For example, the water walk, whose sculptural expression is an individuated human performance and an exhilarating full body experience. Interactive art is predicated on the viewer's participation which in turn constitutes each of the viewers performativity in relation to the artwork. For example, the action of pushing this handle rotates a monitor through a database of hundreds of images. And in the legible city, the viewer performs the work by riding a bicycle and every such performance is a unique exploration of its visual world. The artwork presents an urban landscape of words and sentences, 
that the bicyclist assembles into a personal narrative. It locates these words on the ground plans of actual cities, such as Manhattan and Amsterdam. In the golden calf, the viewer performs the work by walking around a pedestal holding a tablet, which reveals a virtual golden calf standing on the pedestal. Now this augmented reality artwork also allows viewers to see their own real-time reflection in the skin of the golden calf, so that the actual performativity of the viewer is integrated into the work's expression. And in this augmented reality installation, the viewer explores a one-to-one -one virtual representation of the Dunhuang Caves, thereby performing their visualization. In new media art, the interaction of the viewer can become a completely immersive experience. In this installation, the viewer is completely immersed in an all surrounding 3D projection that creates a global virtual world. With sensors in all its joints, the surrogate puppet body at the center of this virtual world can be handled by the viewer to modulate the artwork's various audiovisual manifestations. This leads to a layering of performances, that of the viewer's handling of the puppet, that of the puppet's movements, and that of the resultant movements in the immersive audiovisual environment. The artwork constructs a newly mediated expression of the classical vision of the Vitruvian man and its holistic alignment of microcosm and macrocosm. In the digital domain, live performance is open to various strategies of reinterpretation and reformulation. Working with Peter Gabriel in Genesis and using automated slide projection on three screens, I created one of the first music concerts to be accompanied by a continuous visual narrative using over 3000 slides. Here, a performance by the Japanese dancer Saburo Teshigawara is video recorded in 3D from six different points of view. This is then represented uh, via a 3D back projection onto the six surfaces of a large hexagonal enclosure around which the viewer can walk and watch the performances from six points of view. This is in effect a holographic reconstruction. The performers are viewable in 3D at a one-to-one -one scale as if they were actually dancing inside within the hexagonal enclosure. In the digital domain, one can also articulate, articulate live performance as an interactive dialogue with the viewer. Here we recorded the Singaporean poet Edwin Thumbu reciting 28 different poems. And then we put them in a 360 degree 3D projection environment. 
using a microphone to control a virtual microphone, the viewer could choose which poem to listen to and in cutting between them, create new and unique poetic combinations. Drink from the nectaries. For instance, most footpaths shimmer and sweat at noon. Matter of fact, enjoy two oversized cars, Aspen Ski Lodge. You give time enough, O oh Father of Light. In this work, we created an apparatus for the spatial distribution of multiple interconnected, interconnected narratives that the viewer could freely navigate. And this configuration of an interactive cinema is on the one hand linear, and yet it allows the viewer to become the camera person and the editor so that everyone can assemble their own personal movie experience. We built this special panoramic camera to shoot another such interactive, multi-narrative movie with the New York-based Wooster Group. Their multiple performances. Okay, now this is sort of predicated on the idea that, uh, you know, if you go to a movie... Then and their respective director, yet interconnected narratives what you're gonna see, are spread you're across the 360 outside. degrees around the viewer. Um, its interface is a chair that allows the viewer to look around and the area they are looking at is in focus, whereas everything peripheral is out of focus. Similarly, the soundtrack is modulated to where the viewer is looking. In this installation, over 30,000 video clips that were sourced from free-to-air television can be interactively explored in a 3D space. Each video clip has metadata. So when you click on any one, it will search for others that are similar and cluster those in front of you while placing the most dissimilar behind you. By dragging and dropping these video clips, you can assemble your own movie. It's a kind of Lego kit for cinematic narrative. I always wondered if there was somebody on the other side of the universe. Nostalgic. Like right now? Yeah, yeah, and they're asking the exact same question. Nostalgic. Wait. Trump. Computer code can create humanoid performers and also script their behaviors, both automatically and interactively. Now, this new world of performativity is also informed by AI and by machine learning. This mixed reality installation, which is based on a text by Samuel Beckett, puts a community of virtual humans in a 3D back projected six sided enclosure. Spectators can view this community of virtual humans using torches, which are positioned around the six screens. Both their appearances and the real-time performances of these virtual humans is determined by computer code whose behavioral scripts are directly derived from Samuel Beckett's texts. This diagram describes the computer coded organization of this artwork's behavioral scripts again, based directly on um, 
Beckett's texts. Both their appearances You can also use your torch to illuminate both the virtual world and the real person who is standing opposite you, thereby conjoining two disparate performing conditions, performative conditions. Now, this is another Beckett inspired work here. Whenever someone steps on a mat on the floor, a group of push puppet like virtual humans will fall and then rise up when the viewer steps off the mat. The algorithmically determined behavior of these virtual humans is such that they never fall the same way twice. So that every fall is a never to be repeated performance that is triggered by the action and the complicity of the viewer. Safe House is also a virtual theater inhabited by computationally coded humans who are discoverable using an iPad. Now, while threatened on the outside by the COVID virus, the inhabitants of these lockers safely survive inside. Inside the socially distanced enclosures, the inhabitants are quite active, motivated by movements which they learnt from video games. The new performative is especially relevant to intangible cultural heritage. And I've done quite some work with Chinese martial arts, motion capturing Hong Kong Kung Fu masters. To build a heritage archive of their movements. also exploring styles and methods of visual analytics. And creating art installations to show the results. Here the viewer can interact with the archival database, choosing different forms of visual expression the motion capture data is given new artistic interpretations. Interpretations that evoke the inner dynamics of Kung Fu. And all its energies. Of course, we were also looking for ways to get the visiting public to become Kung Fu masters themselves with this pose matching installation. Master Lam Sai Wing was a great martial artist of the early 20th century in Hong Kong. He left many photos of himself with which we could build a new 3D model of this person. Then we motion captured his great grandson Oscar Lam 
performing one of Lam Se Wing's Kung Fu sets. And we applied that motion capture data to the virtual model. The result is this computationally reconstruction of a deceased master brought back to life via a digitized performance by his familial descendant. Hampi is a heritage site in India, and this rotating platform lets viewers explore it in 360 degrees and 3D. Uh, this is the rotating uh, dual camera system that we used to capture 3D photographic panoramas. And the scan panoramas were then used to construct a Hampi virtual landscape. These photographic pan panoramas were then populated with performances by Hindu deities. Here, for instance, Ganesha, the elephant god. Now navigating the virtual Hampi landscape and entering one of its sites, we encounter Krishna dancing. A virtual animation driven by the motion capture of a live dance performance. The remaking of Confucian Rites project consists of the reenactment of the rites recorded in the Yi Li Book of Rites and Ceremonial compiled in the 5th century BCE. The project explores numerous mediated strategies of documentation of these ritual performances. For example, a kind of Google Earth aerial view recording of the entire performance. Also using a 360 degree high resolution video camera custom built for this production, enabling an immersive virtual reality view of the performance. This all encompassing archival project also documents each performer's attire. It also offers analytical documentation of all the ritual behaviors and postures. Ritual behaviors and postures were also analyzed via motion capture. The resulting documentary archive can be presented and experienced in various ways. This was a three channel installation which specifically focuses on the handling of ritual vessels.
And this three screen installation presents a very immersive experience of the capping ceremony. Even more immersive are our VR renderings of these ceremonies, which we plan to publish as an app for home viewing. The VR model is a hybrid virtual world that incorporates all the real life video recordings that we made. The viewer can freely navigate the temple environment and choose whichever video sequence they wish to enter. The online publication of these performances is also one of our priorities. This is a prototype of the capping ceremony that allows the viewer to interactively explore its video database. The Archery app will soon be available for both uh, Apple and Android users. The start page offers a short introduction by Professor Peng Lin and a 30 minute edited documentary of the entire ceremony, which is these are presented full screen. And besides these conventional forms of video documentation, the most important feature of this app is its interactive archive. In this archive, over eight hours of video data is organized geographically, north, south, east and west, according to where the action is taking place at the ritual temple site. Up to 12 video clips can be running simultaneously around the central window. And the viewer is in, is, becomes the real time editor of these multiple video streams and is able to view the performance from any point of view. The archive runs in chapters across a three and a half hour timeline, but over eight hours of video data is available to be selected from during this three and a half hour timeline. Again, all the video data distributed around the periphery of your central viewing window, where you can just basically pull any, uh, any clip in um, to um, edit together the, uh, the points of view that you wish to address. This interactive archive offers many other layers of information that are also distributed across the timeline of the performance. And this includes the analytics of ritual vessels and attire, ritual behavior and posture, as well as extensive scholarly notations. Just to give you some, um, some credits for this project, which is a close cooperation also with uh, Tsinghua University. I'd like to thank you all for watching this uh, presentation. Uh, I hope with this uh, keynote, uh, I've been able to give you some new insights uh, into the exciting realms of the new performative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shaw. And so great and so rich the uh, keynote presentations. Uh, I, I believe there will be a lot of uh, interesting perspective and maybe questions from audience, uh, which inspired by your uh, work on the different types of media and 
and perhaps and lead us to some new imaginations of what kinds of performance, live performance would be because of the advancements and developments of uh, technologies as, as you have shown in many different applications. I leave it to the Q&A sections and invite the audience to give us some feedbacks. And um, Professor Shaw, please stay for a while. Sure. And, uh, well, now we would like to introduce uh, another um, speaker, um, Henrik Restengall. Uh, Henrik uh, uh, is director of Live Art Denmark. Uh, he co-founded the organizations in 2004. And may I invite uh, Henrik to come and, and let um, be also uh, present in the screens. And Henrik, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, oh thanks. Uh, good okay. to hear your voice. Uh, Yes. Hi, I, I'm just introducing your uh, organization's uh, Live Arts Denmark, uh, which is um, co-founded by, by you. And the organization is also a great organization to present a lot of um, programs, including 15 festivals and 100 events, with a lot of collaborations with different artists from many different fields. And today, uh, Henrik will share with us with a talk on documentation as an art form. So it's so great to have your sharings and, and I leave it the space to you. Henrik, please. Um, hello, my name is Henrik Estakon and I come from Live at Denmark. We are an organization that works in between performance art and performing arts, and we spend a lot of time documenting both of them. Here I will mostly talk about performance art, but these strategies can easily be applied for most performing arts artworks. Thank you to IATC Hong Kong for inviting me to this future called documentation. When I started in Copenhagen in the 90s, performance art was mostly something we read about. Often the text was accomplished by a picture of the performance, and if we were lucky, we were able to see a badly recorded video. That changes when I moved to Berlin in the zeros. Not least because of the status of performance art has changed, but also because there was a lot going on. In the text I read about performance art in the 90s, it was often emphasized with David Thielen that performance art cannot be saved, recorded, or documented. And other persons told us that performance art defined itself as resistance, also in relation to the academia, um, so in that it, it tried to resist any sort of categorization. Performance art should be here and now, something you experience with your whole body. It always felt odd that while we were studying performance art, we were more or less told that we could not study it, because we had to be there when it had happened. That contradiction was underlined by the whole system that has been built around performance art in order to study it. Many performance theories deny reproduction, but the art form itself finds itself surrounded by structures that are built upon documentation. This contradiction somehow made it even more interesting to study, and to claim that performance art cannot be put in boxes made it even more interesting to put performance art in boxes. Since we started Live Art Denmark, we have filmed and taken photos of many performances or asked others to do that for us. On our YouTube channel, it's possible to watch more than 200 different pieces of performance art. And on our homepage, you can read text and see pictures of more than 300 artists that we have presented over the years. But at the same time as just documenting most performance, we show also various ways of documenting. As a documentator, you should ask, what exactly do you wish to documentate? meaning what feature of the work, the atmosphere, the content, the number of objects. Why is it important to save that work? What do you want the documentation to do and to whom, by how many? Must the documentation always be meant for all eternity and everybody? Or could it just be a few years for a single person as a private memory? Do you document for the archives or for a new audience? 
The first performance presented by Live Art Denmark in 2004 was a performance lecture by Tanya Ostojits, looking for a husband with an EU passport. In August 2000, Ostojits published an ad with the title Looking for a husband with an EU passport. She exchanged over 500 letters with numerous applicants from around the world. After a correspondence with uh, German Clement G, she arranged that they could meet. The meeting was also a public performance in the field in front of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade, 2001. Mon months later, they officially married in New Belgrade and Osterwitz moved to EU Germany. The performance lecture primarily was a representation of the work up to her currently married status. They had to stay married for five years in order to keep her in the EU. The whole project took more years and without proper documentation it would have looked tiny and would only have reached very few people. The performance lecture added some new layers to the performance so that it was very hard to separate between the live performance and the documentation of it. Simone Ostroff writes in Performing the Archive. In many performances and real-time events, the documentation of artworks often ended up exchanging places with the work itself. Documentation, usually made in a different medium from that of the original work, went on to perform its own engagement with the audience and often through the mass media. Arts in faces on real things, eventually structures, real gesture in real life, as a result, eventually transferred the question of representation to the real of documentation usually in the form of photo or video. Live Art Denmark has been producing many videos and photos that represent the performance we have shown. In our over 16 years of existence, we have focused on many things. One of them to keep the artists we work with happy, and most of them are happy for the videos and photos we have taken. We also need to show the Danish Arts Council and others that we are productive. But we have, from the start, been aware that the good documentation should be another performance experience. What we have from the start been aware of that a good documentation should be another performative experience. I will in the following try to outline some of the thoughts we have had along the way and some of the most fitting projects. About half of the projects described have taken place within Live Art Denmark's frame, but we would have loved to be the presenter. Good documentation is an art form in its own right. Which also was the case with the second performance live art Denmark presented. Wagner Feigl Festspiele Forschung, the Encyclopedie of Performance Art. In the 2004 version, they stated by telling how performance artists often find it difficult to find out if the material they will use in a performance has been used by other performance artists. Therefore, Wagner Feigl has set out to create an encyclopedia of performance art. In the performance, they, for instance, present a long chapter on the use of tomatoes in performance. Which artist has used tomato, and what is the difference between tomatoes and ketchup, for instance? The work received heavily by the academica, which could see a lot of use for the encyclopedia, but it was never really the intention of Wagner and Feigl to actually create and complete encyclopedia of performance art. It was very much a way to inspire themselves and others to work with the history of performance art. In their most present work, Sophie and Selle in Berlin, 2020, they dissembled a car and used its different parts in various smaller performances, exploring the history of performance art, Wolfgang Flatz, Chris Burton, Paul Fostel, etc. And examining other ways to let the car perform. One night was, for instance, a light performance that only took so long as the car batteries could power the car lights. All the work is full of references to other performance artists, and without documentation of these performances, Wagner and Feigl would be very different if they would exist at all. Artists need to see previous work by other artists in order to develop their practice and not just repeat the past. Without proper documentation, scholars will not see, compare and discuss work of important artists. Museums and galleries will not exhibit it, and wider public will not gain access to it. Good documentation is necessary if performance artwork shall find its right place in the history of art, be taught in school, and reported in the media. Documentation has played an important part ever since 2004 for us, and we have been feeding both artists and the performance system with material ever since.
not just because there's a lot of audience for documentation of the works than the actual work itself, but because documentation is of the work or part of the work. In these performances, live present is so intertwined with the documentation that it can be hardly to distinguish between live performance and documentation. In the work, shoot from 1971, a friend apparently shot Chris Burton in the arm. The performance was documented with several cameras, but nowhere on the material Burton decided to present to the public, you can see the actually hit in the arm. The sound of the shell dropping on the floor, that's horn. When he was invited to the Venice Biennale some years later, he gave each person lining up outside his tent a private version of the event. And in the tent, he told many different versions of the event, which served to confuse the uh, idea about the performance even more. But since the work is actually about expectation, media and disorientation, this was a brilliant way to document it, which was in itself a new work and an unforgettable experience for those, as well as intriguing and amusing story for everybody else who heard about it. Nick Cade writes, if performance can exist by means of rumor, then the conventional opposition between the ephemerality of live art and its material remains becomes uncertain, as work may be gain their current, currency primarily through these remainders. In 2001, I saw a performance in Skate um die Wurst in Oslo Kunsthalle, a work by Leis Ramberg. At first, I did not like it because it, it seemed so incomplete. There were some sausages, an expensive car, and a garage. It didn't make sense until I talked with Lars Ramberg later at a bar. He and some other person traveled from Berlin to Oslo in a Mercedes with 100 kilo of vegan sausages. It was shortly after 9-11, and the sausages looked like dynamite attached to the buck. At the same time, it was forbidden to bring meat from into Norway because of the fear of pig flu. So they felt a bit like terrorists having these sausages attached to the party. They drove from Berlin high up in Sweden because they did not dare to take the obvious route into Norway. Each of them stuffed 25 kilos of sausages in their clothes and crossed the border. Very afraid, of course. It wasn't a problem for them to cross the border, and they drove down to Oslo and presented the work. It was a fantastic story, but it wasn't a visual part of the performance shown at Oslo Kunsthall. In the public performance, there was a screen showing four persons at a gas station somewhere in Germany. That was it. If you wanted the whole story, you had to speak to the performers afterwards. The backstory maybe did not convince me about the quality of the performance as such, but it was an important lesson that you can actually document a performance only by telling. In 2007, Live Art Denmark presented Christopher Hewitt's performance art jukebox at our own first, third Berliner Luft Festival. It was basically Christopher Hewitt presenting his archive of performance art. If somebody wanted to see Chris Burton or something else, they could. But more important than the actual footage he had in his uh, archive was a discussion about it, the hearsay about it, uh, to which Christopher added his own gossip about the performances. Some work described at the performance art jukebox are stories and rumors circulating in the performance art uh, milieu. They could be made up, but that, does not, but that does not make them less interested or less relevant. Sometimes the inside story of an artist struggle to realize his or her work is more impressive than the actual work. In 2011, Live at Denmark screened a couple of Marco's coach work at our own Samtan Køben. In the trip 2011, he worked with dying people at a hospice with the intention of realizing things they have not done during their lifetime. One had always wanted to paddle down the Amazon River in a canoe. Marcus Coates did, Marcus Coates did it for him and took pictures. But at the return, he chose not to reveal the pictures, but to describe the trip orally to the man in much detail as a man would have his own memory of the trip. A video shows the grey and dull London street seen from the hospital's window during the meeting. So the viewer must create their own image too. The oral documentation of the trip down the Amazonas seems in Coates' case to be of greater importance than the photograph documentation. Of course, you can never completely be objective in a documentation, but it's always a decision that needs to be taken. Do you want to starve against objectivism or leave more to the imagination of the viewer or listener? 
which is a question of goal of the artwork or the documentation. A documentation should always address the essence of the work. Because of this, documentation may not be the best work. Perhaps publication or republication is better in the sense of making public, reaching people of the work and making it come alive for a new and wider audience who did not experience the first version or the live version. At Live at Denmark, we do not documentate performance art for the archive, but for a future audience, so we're always concerned with the performative potential of the documentation. A documentarist can decide to document selected aspects of the original work, such as the actual order of events or the atmosphere. But the important must be the feeling of live and now, because this is what defines the art form compared to other art forms. A documentation can feel incredibly dusty and dead. How do we preserve the intensity of the now? How can the documentation perform or create a new now? In 2014, we were invited to host an event at Overgaden Art Center in Copenhagen during the annual Copenhagen Culture Night. Here, we invited three established painters to create painting on adults' faces. Hence the title, Face Painting for Adults. It was a new experience for the visitors. To have a painting on the faces would, could actually cost a small fortune. The only way to keep the painting was to take a picture of it. And by that it became a work in several steps. The painters became performers, and after being painted in the faces and proceeding into the streets, the guests became performers as well. And as the immediate spread on the social medias, the work had a third life where it performed yet again to a new audience. It was delivering short-lived documentation, which investigated how traditional painting and performance art differ in duration, production, contradictions, and economical value. Photos are a great way of documenting performance art, among others because a picture can make a work look very exciting, even if it's not. Art museums are quite aware of this, and some seem to purposely invite artists which will look good in Instagram and show me accounts. A key component in a good documentation is engaging the viewer physically, intellectually, or both. Today, everybody has a good camera in their phone, and most people like to take pictures, especially if they or their friends are in the frame. But photos are also great because the way our mind works. When experience a work only documented partly, the brain will start filling out the missing information by imagining the work and create inner images. A good documentation puts the viewer to work. Photos as documentation work through that way that they do not tell everything. <coughs> Brilliant artist knows exactly how much to reveal and what not in order to engage the viewer. From a conversation between Alex Dermak Linan and Amanda Coogan, transcript by Aline Philip. Both agreed that still photograph documentation was often more useful in transmitting a vivid sense of what the performance work is about. Kogan continues, a live performance sometimes cannot be translated. I'm often happier with the stills, but they go somewhere else. Phillips adds, I suggest that the photograph still documentation images often provide a mystery open space in which the viewer can project meaning. Again, Chris Byrne was a master of this willfully fuzzy documentation as described. Another one is a Danish artist, Lea Porsere, who amongst other places, documented or participated in documentary 13 with the Anatta experiment in 2012. It arose around Monte Barretti in Ascona, Switzerland. In the early 1900s, this magnetic hill was attract, attracted uh, anarchists and occultists. In the summer of 2011, Porsche invited seven friends to Casa Anatta. Uh, and the work during this week was exhibited at Documenta as a collection of mystic and almost undepictable images. Almost. Another example is Haley Newman, an English artist who published a book called Connotations, Performance Images 1994 to 1998, with the images from the works she had done in that period, and also from the ones which remained ideas at the time. She still felt, however, that they were part of her practice and practice background and decided to stage them for a camera during one long week. This was of course in itself quite a performance where she should change her hair lengths and skin colors constantly to match the relevant year and the season for the work. 
In most museums, the forms are lack a well-defined space. The main problem seems to be that one cannot return to a performance like to a painting. There is no standard method for displaying and preserving the art form in museums. Painting has established uh, preserv preservation techniques, but in terms of performance art, you have to deal with each work individually. Media and museums prefer something with a longer duration than performance art normally has. A common way to solve this is to work with relics and leftover from live performances. In her performance, Heavy Light, Danish Sophie Dupont created canvases with prints that can be exhibited or sold. That means these images are from Kulstrup 15 Festival at Murkamp in Aalborg that we presented some years ago. Another Danish artist, Lillebeth Koenka Rasmussen, used another method. In the week after opening of an exhibition, she invited family members and other artists to work with her on different materials. In 2002, Norwegian Tove Amstrup created an exchange library for performance art in Oslo, which was also an archive with performance objects from her past. You could exchange objects from your own performance if they had a good story for her objects, which keep the exhibition very much alive. The archive is a format which dates back over Ilya and Emilia Kabakov and to early centuries of the Wonder Kammer and the Cabinet of the Curiosities where strange and everyday like objects and documents was archived according to individual principles and rules. A present day version of the Wunderkammer is the German Borsen Islonis wonderful archive, The Black Kids in Köln, Cologne, where everything, even remotely performance related, is stored alphabetically in boxes and folders. Under the letter K, for instance, you find the performance from Canada, Indian, Indian regional ritual performed on knees, and the urine containing the ashes of his friend, Norbert Klassen. Like photo, writing is a form of documentation that works really well. One of the best books we have read about Joseph Boyce's work carefully describes a performance action by action. It requires the reader to participate by forming internal images. We use this example for the registration of performance at our own for Berliner Luft Festival 2004-2009 where we presented German theatre in Copenhagen. But the written word can also be a performative investigation in its own right. Adam Karpov describes how the woman keeping her diary on her walls in a daily changing landscape of sand, in a study of whether one can recreate exactly the same walk twice from a description. A similar study was conducted by the important Danish performance artist or philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. He lived all his life in Copenhagen and left the country only twice, once to go to Berlin where he visited the theatre and then again to go to Berlin if he see to, to examine if a repetition is possible. This investigation is described in the book The Repetition by the fictive character Konstantin Konstantinos. Ellen Fries, with whom I have live at Denmark together, reenacted this walk as part of her Six Saints series. Johannes from the sedu Seducer's Diary was another <coughs> role in Kierkegaard's writing. His various identities and this investigation of the blurring of art and life in writing are very modern and point to the works of the Danish Madame Nielsen, for example. Madame Nielsen was born Klaus Bick Nielsen in 1963. In 2001, Klaus Bick Nielsen declared himself dead and became an institution instead. Das Beckwerk, which went on to produce artworks, installation and books. Still, people continue to refer to it as Klaus Beck Nielsen. So nearly a decade after his death, it was decided to hold a funeral. In 2011, an effigy was buried. And in 2013, Madame Nielsen appeared. She performs and writes books. Performative criticism, like documentation, can be performative, so can criticism. The do, open dialogue, and their project, Critical Writing on and as Performance by Mary Patterson and Rachel Louise Clapham took up ideas in existing live artworks, investigation and exploring the path that works could still take. They also arranged a similar critics and cocktails in Copenhagen as part of Mary Patterson's residency with us in 2014. Perhaps the most common documentation format is film and video. For traditional theatre it can be fine since the stage is often presented like a flat TV screen anyway. And theatre is all about representation. Everything that happens is registered 
which can be practical for a precise reconstruction in a museum sense, but rarely provides an interesting experience in itself. Perhaps even because the viewer seems too much and has no instrument to imagine the missing information. Several of the artists mentioned here planned the documentation carefully before the execution of their performance works. An artist like Christian Fetsnes had been working with very professional recordings of his performance. Here the documentation often is the work. In 2006, Philip Auslander wrote in the performance of documentation that the act of documentation an event as a performance in which it constitutes as such. The defined the truth for many of Fetsnes' work and that they inspired us to create a series of performances created for an iPad called Now and Again. We wanted to generate a new performance, performative situation where eight videos were being watched. Besides Christian Fentners, we asked Lillebeth Kuenka Rasmussen, Joachim Amu, Sophie Ulrup Smits, Ellen Fries, Stine Marie Jacobsen, Erik Holt, and Olof Olsen to create performances. They were presented one by one over the year 2014 at Photographic Center in Copenhagen. In his performance for now and again, Christian Fentners asked the viewer to dance with him and touch themselves inside a box which at some point could be observed from the outside by other visitors. The video format also offers other possibilities for manipulating time and space, etc. as an example, Marcus Coates, Local Birds from 2001, which uses the video format and speed of the time so the performers will tremble and trample like their favorite birds. After years of working with various means of documentation, we thought that it would be interesting to how much of the original performance we could actually capture in virtual reality. When a new generation of VR technology emerged in 2016, we acquired the first small 360 degrees camera to test if it was good for documentative performance. We had the vision that it would be perfect for the typical small performances that last 20 minutes and it's watched by 8 to 10 people in a wide cube gallery. The results were convincing, so we bought a more expensive camera in 2018 with six small lenses, which can record in 8K or 6K 3D. All of the documentation we tried yet, it comes closest to simulating reality. In addition to the work itself, the viewer experienced the mood in the room and the interaction with the audience, and the same freedom as in the real world to turn around and focus on what they feel like they want to inspect, whether it's the sideman or what's in front of them, or the sky or the floor. Currently, we have Google's with an internal drive, which holds about 20 uh, different works that we have recorded over time. We have traveled to Cameroon, to Canada, Stockholm, and many other places, and shown our small archive, which we consider to be the world's smallest performance art festival. Hope to come to Hong Kong one day and show it to you. But even though virtual reality is quite convincing, we are at the same time examining another trail. Maybe you can call the event score the oldest way to document performance art. The event score were, were especially popular in the 1960s Fluxus movement, and uh, the futuristic cookbook from the 1930s was a forerunner. Here, artists would write recipe, recipes for works in a poetic language, which were probably not meant to be reenacted re by the reader other than in his or her imagination. The event score from the 60s and forward could be very poetic but they're also meant to be realized in many cases. We've been interested in the score since our days of stopping, but never find the right occasion for them until we rent Ken Friedman's score, Fluxus Instant Theatre from 1966. Restore Fluxus event for performance for an audience. A conductor might guide the audience. And then we started to collect event scores to present them in workshop and in a revue called Virat Revue, which consists of 15 works that we create together with the audience. One example of the event score is Mega Salad from 1961 by Alison Knowles. By recreating that work, you're invited into the choice of an artistic process. Should you make a small salad of leftovers from the fridge, or 100 kilo of salad thrown from the balcony of the Tate Modern? Buy one rather than the other. Traditional drama and sheet music for actors and music pose similar challenges, of course. We have both worked with remakes of other artists and thinkers' works during our solo careers. In the fall of 2019, we staged a version of Playing Up, a game produced by Forschungs to Adam Hamburg. It consists of 36 cards from performance art history, explaining the works in a few short sentences, and offering the audience the objects and tools to recreate the works together for fun. 
It was first exhibited in Tate Modern in 2016 and by Live Art Denmark at Copenhagen Contemporary 2019. Marina Gramovic, who is a part of the playing up with Fringe Awards, said earlier, The only real way to document a performance art piece is to re-perform re the piece itself. Which is definitely truth about Freaking the Voice, which is rather sc simple. Scream until the voice is lost. It was performed in Budapest in 1967. In the video recording, we see Abramovich laying on her back, tilting her head back, so the audience and the camera have a face in full view. It adds so much more to the performance to re-perform it than to watch the video. A game of live art is a work in itself, as which an introduction for others to play. Other artists who have performed with the game formats are, for example, Joshua Sophia, who have developed performance artist game for the family, but also investigates other reality TV-inspired formats, such as public treasure hunts, or voting for certain citizens to reach instant fame by having his or her name in light all over a large building. Since 2019, we have also invited artists in residency at Copenhagen Contemporary, where they present a work and then develop it into a recipe that others can do. We do that together with the educational department uh, to, to create works that new museum's guests can recreate in the future. Here in 2020, we just took over these new rooms in Copenhagen North Harbor, where we will start to work to create works for virtual reality, created for virtual reality, uh, so people can come in here and experience a performance that has taken place here uh, for a camera. So the audience can take over the role from the camera. That's a new area that I can maybe talk about at a later point in time. Conclusion of all this might be that different works demand different means of documentation. Some works are better off without documentation, some bits best with uh, just a photo. But most important is to decide if the documentation should be an artwork in its own right. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, uh, I have to uh, say sorry to the audience. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not a qualified moderator because I, I just uh, so nervous to introduce the guest speaker, but without introducing myself. <laughs> and I don't even mention that um, Henrik preferred uh, let us know the pre-recording video first, and then he would like to join the discussion with us. And that's my apology sends to the audience. Okay, well, now we are in the um, uh, discussion sections. And while I'm waiting for um, my colleagues to collect questions from the audience, I would like to uh, raise the first questions to both of the speaker. It seems to me that after listening to the um, presentations, uh, you, the speaker, you too, would, would uh, give up the assumption that we can do something to reconstruct a past performance or a past uh, presentation. Is it? Is, am I right to say that? Henrik or Professor Shaw? Yes. Would you? Uh -huh. yes, I think, but of course, uh, every time you can recreate the past, but it becomes something new, um, you, you cannot, it, it will become something else, something different, which is not bad. It's, it's, it's a good thing uh, that it can point new ways. And that way you can also uh, reactualize a work by recreating it. So my, my short answer would be yes. Okay. So uh, Professor Shaw, uh, when you keep the record for the visual art, artwork, so what, what's the purpose if then we, we cannot objectively reconstruct your artworks again? So what will your purpose to, to do some record or documentation for, for your work? Look, in, in the presentation that I made, I showed a, a whole range of, um, of strategies of um, you could say documentation now often documentation that i'm talking about is not documentation in the in the usual sense of um, you know preserving memory of of an event uh, often um, 
the documentation itself becomes the event. In other words, many of these works are actually um, strategies of creating embodied documentation, performative documentation, uh, interactive documentation, so that the, uh, the documentary experience itself is the work, right? Uh, and that was the case in a number of the pieces I showed you, uh, such as um, I don't know, T Visionarium with all the, the videos, uh, the work with Edwin Thumbu, the, the Singaporean poet, uh, also the work with the dance piece with, um, with the Saburo Teshigarawa. You know, this was a, not the documentation of an existing dance piece, but a work that he made specifically for this um, apparatus so that uh, the actual performance of this work is embodied in its digital reproduction, okay? That's where the work exists, yeah? And also I showed you strategies where uh, works, let's say, by the Wooster Group, uh, for instance, um, are um, 360 degree cinematic performances. But again, the performance is not the original performance, the performance is its mediated presentation and the ability of the viewer to be able to navigate and interact and edit. Uh, the viewer becomes camera person and editor. And that's where the performance takes place. So this is, let's say, a strategy of documentation where the documentation itself becomes actually the work. On the other hand, uh, in the works we've done with uh, martial arts and with the Confucian rites, these indeed are strategies of building an archive of uh, intangible cultural heritage, uh, um, documenting Kung Fu masters here in Hong Kong, creating remaking uh, a conf you know, the Confucian rites, re-performing them, uh, rites which have not been uh, performed for, for you know, over a hundred years, being performed again for the first time. And again, these rites are no longer currency. So one performance is a big effort. We, we, it takes us about a year to prepare for one performance to do all the necessary uh, academic research that uh, informs that performance. So here again, the intention was to create a performance that will live as documentation. In other words, the performance is, is aimed towards uh, the construction of a documentary project. Uh, and what I showed you was one of its, uh, one of its manifestations, uh, which would be a, a website where you yourself could take the complete uh, eight and a half hours of documentary data and edit that yourself, assemble that yourself to uh, interrogate that, that performance. But at the same time, we use the same data for installations in museums, like a, you know multi-screen installations. So there becomes a whole series of, let's say, um, embodiments of this performance and it's the embodiments themselves which we are aiming towards, whereas the performance is just, um, well, it's done privately as a as a as a as a place where the, where you can um, um, establish uh, that documentary evidence. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, what it, what it all adds up to is that, from my point of view, the space of documentation is very very broad. And uh, there are many ways in which uh, documentary evidence can, as Henrik said, become uh, as much uh, an artistic statement as the work itself. And in some cases, actually supplant the work itself as the artistic statement, as the performative experience. Thank you very much. I, I uh, collect one question from the floor. It said, uh, for from one audience, uh, from the seminar, uh, I can categorize what I have heard in the seminar into um, creative and truly sensory documentary, interactive art, VR. Have I missed anything? And there <laughs> are there ways to categorize digital technology application. I repeat the questions. Yeah. Yeah. So would uh, Professor Shaw 
I, I, I don't see I, I don't see the need to uh, to create such a, a, a extreme reduction. I mean, if you need to do that for whatever purpose, but you know, if we talk about VR, there is there are a hundred flavors of VR, right? There's the VR of wearing goggles. There's the VR of three sixty degree immersive projection. Um, there's the virtual reality of uh, you know of uh, of, a, of a classical painting, right? Which also is a, a kind of uh, a, embodies a, you know a strategy of virtual, um, let's say, construction, virtual representation. So, VR has an enormous range of potentialities. I mean, photography. Just think of it. Photography is photography. Okay, but there are a million ways in which a photograph can map can embody itself. I mean, photography is a great is an enormous span of potentiality, and videography and cinematography are also have an enormous range of ways in which these things can be utilized. So, I think what's more important is rather than just say, okay, these are the the the, the basics of documentation one should appreciate that, that we are dealing with a vast range of potentialities. And that that means that in each instance where you make us, where you want to create a body of documentation, you can choose a, a completely idiosyncratic strategy, which is tailored to that particular situation and that particular requirement and that particular, whatever your objective is. I see. Okay. There is another question addressing uh, Professor Shaw. Um, it, it said, I do not recall that you have worked with local performing arts groups in Hong Kong. Do you think it is because local artists are not aware of your good work well enough or because your type of work is usually very cost intensive? Is very what intensive? Cost intensive. intensive, very costly. <laughs> it's not. I assure you, it's not. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's not that's not an issue. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I can't give you an answer to that. Um, uh, I mean, a, a very strong Hong Kong engagement has been with uh, the archive of uh, martial arts, and uh, so this has been going on for many years. Um, and of course, the project with the Confucian rites is closely connected to, to Chinese uh, history and is a partnership between CTU and Tsinghua. Um, the extent to which uh, there may have been opportunities to work with um, dancers or theater makers here in Hong Kong, um, I, I can't give you an answer to that. I mean, the, 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 the uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm there. I'm a, you know, my the potentiality of what I'm doing is uh, is known, and it's not. It doesn't even really depend on me. I mean, there's a lot of documentation uh, that's already published about the work I've been doing, and other artists can uh, build on that and uh, extend that without necessarily depending on my uh, on my personal uh, sort of um, involvement. But um, I don't know. Maybe Henrik also has a. I mean, Henrik, you've shown wonderful examples of this range of, uh, of uh, performing arts practices that you've been working with. And uh, I'm curious to what extent you have, you know, how focused the interest is for you locally with local artists. Oh, it is. We would very much like something um, to work more with local artists. And we do work with local artists. The thing is, Denmark is rather small. We have 5.5 million people and the performance art scene isn't that interesting. So we like to bring in people from elsewhere to show what perform what you can do with performance art. Uh, there's a, as you say, with cinema and photo, but perform performance art can also be so many different things. And what we see in, in Denmark, Copenhagen is, is very narrow. This is performance art. It's put in a, in a box over here by the Art Academy, and we have another uh, box over here. And it's for me that it's not very interesting to, to repeat what people already are do, doing here. I like to bring in people and, and show something different. Mm. 
Well, maybe I have um, another question to follow up my previous uh, inquiry about the natures of documentation. Because when we talk about documentation, people usually um, associate with uh, linear recording or preservations of the past event or past uh, happening, um, a show or artwork. So it is um, a recording of uh, the beginning of the middle of the end product as a kind of linear types of records. And it seems to me that both of you break this perception very much. Uh, Henrik talk about different types of means of documentation from oral picture, VR and some other types. And also Professor Shaw, you're in your work, um, lets the visitor to control some of the records and by himself or herself. So um, the interesting questions I would like to ask is, um, how can we plan for these types of uh, documentation? If it is not after the event, or should we start quite early in the beginning uh, when the artist or creator want to um, um, use uh, different types of documentations when doing his artwork? What, when when this, this new type of documentation should begin? It depends on what kind of work you do, but I would mostly say that it starts when you begin the project, that you're already thinking about where should this go? And what is the performance? Is, is the performance, final performance here, something that is happening with the audience in a theater space? Um, or could it be something else? It's, it's just raising questions to what you want to documentate, what you want to uh, put into your archive, because there's so much thinking behind uh, happening before you do the performance in the in the theater space that all maybe also belongs in a documentation of it. Or maybe you want to do something completely different. You know, it's the audience that are watching a, a film performance, a, a simply film performance, is a different audience than the audience that sits in the theater space. Mm -hmm. So you have to think a lot more about which audience do you want to um, show your piece to and where and such and think it in from, from the start. Professor mm Shaw, -hmm. would you like to respond? Or? So um, I think that, uh, yeah, in each situation, uh, a creator of a work will have uh, some um, ambition uh, with respect to the longevity of that work and maybe envisage ways in which that work will live on after it's, uh, after it has, uh, after its last performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and one could be modest and say it will just live on in people's memories or it may live on in somebody who's written a few, uh, a, a review of it, or it may live on in photography or it may live on in cinematography or you may make a more concerted effort to create a document, yeah, which uh, somehow or other is meant to reflect that work. I mean, you might, for instance, employ a cinematographer who is uh, a master uh, cinematographer in their own right, who is going to create an in um, cinema cinematographic interpretation of that work, which will then have its own identity, but will have that longevity, the longevity of, of, a cinema, of a piece of cinema, as opposed to a live performance. But um, in my own, um, in many things I was uh, showing you, I was more concerned with issues to do with how one can take, let's say, um, intangible or tangible cultural heritage that is embedded in the past and how one can um, reconstruct, reinterpret, uh, remake those works in such a way that they become uh, living documents in the present, okay? That in other words, one can re-embody these works. Now, such re-embodiments are not the remaking of the original by no way. We don't even know what the original was, right? We don't, there's nobody left to tell us what the experience 
of the original was. All we can talk about is how do we construct an experience for today? And one can also even talk about how do we construct an experience for, to, for tomorrow? One can say, I'm building a new experience about this heritage work that, that lives today and may live tomorrow. So these are ways in which uh, heritage materials become, I don't know, become content in a way or frameworks in which one can uh, construct a completely contemporary work. Uh, and this, this I find very interesting, yeah, because it's a way in which history um, can live on, right? And not just be sort of a, a musty, musty documents, you know, sort of, living yeah. in, in shelves. Yeah. It is dynamic, history is dynamic. Okay, I, I, I do have other questions, but my colleagues already stopped me not to do so because of the <laughs> running out of time. And, and thanks very much for uh, attending and giving um, such a great keynote speech. Um, gratitude to Henrik and Professor Shaw. And, so I end here by um, making a final uh, announcement. Um, there is another section uh, for this program, which uh, it is talk will commence at five o'clock and 45 minutes. And uh, welcome to attend the last section two after this break. Okay, okay. say goodbye to Henrik and Professor Shaw. And Thank you, Henrik. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Shaw, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet pleasure you too. To meet you. <laughs>